If you're like me, when you learned history in school, specifically the uglier parts, you always learned the what without the why or the how. The standard books don't ask these questions of historical horrors, because once you figure out the answers, you'll realize that the same things are happening today. In the US, these tactics have taken many forms, but the aim has always been similar. They've been used to justify westward expansion and indigenous genocide, to repress newly freed black slaves, to drum up support for entering World War II, and to sell invasions of the Middle East. We have a long history of those in power convincing people like you and me, who are caring and kind, to do things that people will look back on and say, I would never do anything like that. But unfortunately, we are living through the latest repetitions of these manipulations. See, while the COVID-19 pandemic has been spreading through our bodies, there's been a simultaneous infodemic spreading through our minds. The infodemic is a name given by the World Health Organization to the spread of false information about COVID. And in our country, this spread was amplified by those who were taught to rely on for the truth. Powerful people have been feeding us lies about the virus and making us afraid of each other, all in an attempt to try to cover up a global tragedy and remain in power. In our country, the lies are primarily designed to manipulate those who keep up with right-wing news. One of the biggest lies is that the virus is a hoax, or designed to damage President Trump politically. Another is that masks don't work, or actually make you more sick, and are designed to take away your freedoms. And all throughout 2020, the Trump administration and right-wing media spread false and decontextualized information to try to prove these lies. And when it comes to COVID, what you believe can mean life or death. And the lies have undoubtedly led to more deaths. There are even reports from nurses saying that their patients' last words as they were dying of COVID would be saying that it was a hoax. What brought us to this place? And how are these stories all connected pieces of a much longer history? Well, throughout history, false narratives like these have typically had five features. An outgroup is the enemy, an in-group you're a part of, fear, simplicity, and some greater meaning. There's a term for messages like these, particularly when used by the powerful, and at first it may not seem right, but just hear me out. These are the typical features of propaganda. Now, in the US in particular, we often imagine propaganda as huge posters or obviously manipulative old films. But the fact that these are the examples we think of makes the propaganda that we're subject to even more effective because it isn't so obvious. Right? We only see the old examples as obvious because we have hindsight. And there's also this notion that propaganda is only used by authoritarian countries. Right? But that's just another convenient story spread by the powerful we're actually more likely to be subject to propaganda in a democracy because we don't stand for physical coercion by the powerful. So the next best option is to coerce our minds. Like I said earlier, propaganda is not so much an anomaly of our history, but a feature. One of the earliest propaganda campaigns was called Manifest Destiny, justifying the genocide of indigenous people by giving them an outgroup label of savages giving settlers an in-group frontiersmen, making settlers afraid of native people by depicting them as violent and brutish, and wrapping it all up in an overly simplistic rationale designed to give the settlers meaning. It is your divine right to expand. Narratives like this have been used over and over whenever the powerful have wanted to hold on to power or wanted to expand it. These manipulations turn people against each other would otherwise coexist peacefully. And once propaganda is framed like this, it might start to seem a lot more common than we originally thought. So let's check back in on COVID misinformation. Or we can use one popular narrative. The virus is a hoax designed to damage President Trump and take away our popularly elected choice. But we know the real truth. Does it fit the criteria? Right? The out group is opponents of Trump. The in group is Trump voters. 
There's fear of taking away electoral choice, simplicity in ignoring scientific arguments for how COVID arose, and conferring meaning by making you someone who sees the real truth. Narratives like this were spread by an administration whose approval rating was plummeting, and the media companies who supported it, particularly when the facts showed that the US consistently had the highest case and death rates of any country in the world. But the results of this propaganda campaign end with 90% of Fox viewers, who keep in mind are roughly half the country, believing that the US did as much as it could to contain the virus. And to be clear, it's not like Trump voters or Fox viewers are bad people or stupid. They have simply been the targets of the powerful. Their natural curiosity and desire for truth, something innate in all of us, has been weaponized against them. It's clear that this stuff works, which begs the question, how do people not fall prey to propaganda, especially when history and present show a less than stellar track record? Well, this brings up my specific area of study and an intersection of computer science and cognitive science, which is also kind of poetically tied to COVID. See, when social scientists study the spread of beliefs through a population, a term that many use is called social contagion. And there are literally models which imagine beliefs spreading from person to person like a virus. Modeling this spread has been the latest focus of my PhD studies. These animations of models I've made show ideas spreading through interconnected webs of simulated social networks. And you can see it literally looks like a virus spreading through the population. By analyzing these patterns, we can try to understand how beliefs spread and potentially learn how to intervene. And to me, these models aren't just academic exercises, but important investigations trying to figure out how we may be able to move away from being manipulated. So to try to figure out how we may be able to protect ourselves against propaganda, we can even take a page out of virology's book. If beliefs spread like a virus, then we should be able to figure out how to vaccinate ourselves against propaganda. Right? We can even use the same idea as biological vaccines, expose ourselves to old examples of propaganda from history in order to build up an intellectual immune system. And the more examples we get, the stronger this vaccine would be against any potential mutations. And if we really got to the roots of propaganda messaging, we could recognize the manipulations regardless of their particular context. And luckily, cognitive science gives us some insights into these roots. Because each of the five features I mentioned before taps into some of the deepest parts of our brains and psychology. First, group identification has been linked to the parts of the brain responsible for resolving conflicting information and emotional processing. Studies have shown that group thinking allows us to justify immoral behavior against outgroups as long as it's achieving in-group goals. So messages that manufacture outgroup labels like savages or terrorists, while simultaneously constructing in-groups like patriots or true Americans, take advantage of these cognitive processes to control us. Another major factor in propaganda messaging is the use of fear. Right, which is mediated by one of the oldest parts of the brain. Activation of this structure has been shown to impede our ability to think critically and make us more egocentric. Overactivation of it can actually make us perceive threats when in reality, there aren't any. Next is simplicity, right? The fewer cognitive resources anyone has to spend to try to understand something, the easier it is to believe. And often ideas that are already familiar are easier to believe than new ones. That's why propagandists aimed at swaying the public don't bother explaining the geopolitics behind invading Iraq or the capitalist rationale behind the original westward expansion. It's just defeat the terrorists or manifest destiny. And the final aspect of propaganda that makes it so powerful is the fact that it gives a sense of meaning to those who believe it. Meaning is something we all crave. And in societies that have moved away from spirituality or religion, many secular thinkers don't internalize a greater purpose to their lives. Propagandists take advantage of this and give people something to live for, or all too often, something to die for. 
Just by knowing these five patterns that are so good at tricking our brains, we can all take a huge first step towards immunizing ourselves against manipulations. Because once you start to see them, it is really hard to unsee them, and they start to pop up everywhere. So now, when you're reading the news, you can analyze it. Right? Is this message vilifying some outgroup? Is it advocating for an in-group? Is it trying to make you afraid or using overly simple arguments? Is it trying to give you a sense of meaning through something worth fighting for? Now, this all isn't to say that we can only do this work as individuals. Right? Just like COVID has opened many eyes to the role of structural change in creating a society capable of dealing with pandemics, the same is true for propaganda. Right? We can individually vaccinate ourselves with knowledge of the past, but by changing the structures we live under, we can make it easier for everyone to fend off manipulation. Right now, our institutions are not set up to protect us against propaganda. In the US, schools don't typically teach us a worldview that includes the powerful manipulating us throughout history. We don't learn the whys behind things like manifest destiny, nor the skills to see how power works or see through the lies. And once we enter the workforce, right, after exhausting days of work, we understandably don't carefully analyze history or global affairs to try to figure out what's true or false, nor are we encouraged to. Right? And all the while, the news is given to us by for-profit corporations, now including social media companies, who are incentivized to run fear-inducing, outgroup-blaming stories because they lead to the most views and the most profits. If our society was truly committed to ensuring that everyone could be free from manipulation by the powerful, something clearly in the interest of a democracy, we would all have the time, resources, and training necessary to see through the lies. Public education wouldn't just be a nicely edited version of history, but one that includes the hard, ugly truths and would be available to everyone. And that education would include the skills necessary to filter through lies. Maybe if we could work less, or we could use that time to talk with one another, build community, and collectively try to understand our world. But that would mean making a choice as a society. Do we want to be one that prioritizes economic production by workers that know just enough to be functional? Or do we want to be one that prioritizes vibrant communities of diverse, informed, and cooperative people all working together to make the world better for everyone. Well, we don't just have to wait for that type of society to come into existence. Now that you know the patterns of propaganda, you can begin to see them in the narratives you hear and stop their spread by standing up and speaking out. And by being an advocate for a better society that would teach us our history of manipulation and what to do about it in the future, you can contribute to shifting our collective priorities. As a final twist on the uncanny similarities between beliefs and COVID, it's also true that now that you know the patterns of propaganda, you can spread that knowledge to others. In essence, vaccinating people you know. And if enough people start to see the manipulations occurring and have a vision of a better society, then desire for change will be the new idea that spreads, one not based on fear and blaming others, but on hope and bringing more people in. That's the true meaning of bottom-up change and how a democracy should work. So I'll leave you with one final question. Who are you going to spread these ideas to? Thank you.